Hi there, welcome to part two of the video series on Heathkit GC1000 Most Accurate Clock, sitting right there in my display case. If you watched part one of the video, I bought a broken clock off of eBay, I fixed it, I got it to sync with the WWV broadcast signal a couple of times, but I couldn't get it to sync reliably. I spent some time uh, exploring various antenna options, I spent some time recapping it. We got it to kind of work, but not really. I ended up asking the community for help. Well, shortly after publishing that video, I managed to fix the clock. It now syncs approximately 85% of the time. It's in high spec mode right now, and day and night it's syncing uh, routinely with 5 megahertz, with 10 megahertz, with 15 megahertz, just as it's supposed to. The Heathkit manual says anything above 50% is really good, uh, so at 85%, we're well above 50%. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time first discussing what I did to fix this. We'll go through some of the more components that I replaced. And then I'm going to talk about data collection on this clock. So I actually wired up a Raspberry Pi to the LED so I can measure how often it's in high spec mode because it's interesting to know, particularly when evaluating the different antennas. And then I'm going to repair a second clock. I actually got a second one. There's a story behind that, but I'm going to repair a second clock and I'm going to do an alignment of the receiver board on the second clock using a signal generator, an oscilloscope, and my ears to listen to the, uh, the sound of the audio tone coming out of it. So if you've ever wondered how to align one of these, uh, you can watch that segment of the video. If you have one that's not working right, that might be useful. I am certainly not an expert on radio alignment. I'm somewhat new to this, but I followed some procedures I found on the web, and I did get the second clock working. So. Let's move on and talk about how we got the first one working. Okay, so I think I finally resolved the problems with the syncing. And what I did was to replace some more parts on the tone decoder board. So the parts I replaced are these two LM576 uh, tone decoder chips and this LM3900 op amp. And I replaced not only ch the chips, but also the sockets. So they had really poor quality, old, corroded, single leaf springy sockets in them. Now I replaced them with modern uh, machine turned pin sockets. This one, this one, and this one. And then I replaced the ICs. And after that it seems to work much more reliably than it did before. Now just to go over everything that I have changed on this board, um, I changed out these three ICs as well as their sockets. I changed these two potentiometers for 25 turn pots. I replaced this capacitor, this capacitor, and that capacitor. And then I also replaced this one here with a film capacitor. This was an electrolytic. And it was a 3.3 microfarad that was installed. According to the instructions, it was supposed to be a 0.33 microfarad. So I replaced it with a film capacitor, a hand on hand, that was 0.33. I also made a few changes to the RF board. So I replaced some of the electrolytics over here. Um, I believe this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Um, so two of these, I'm thinking uh, this one and this one here, are uh, filtering capacitors for the power supply. Um, these three over here, I think, are probably just for the audio amplifier. And then these two here I didn't replace because I just didn't actually have some of those in my junk box. Okay, for my data collection project, I instrumented the display board with some wires connected to the uh, collectors of the transistors that drive the LEDs. So there's these transistors, a couple of them there, a couple of them there, and I think one over there. Um, so I hooked into those with these silicone wires. I ran it to a little connector down here. Uh, this connector is a JST type connector, I think. And it's hooked up to each collector so that when the microprocessor goes to light that LED, it pulls this down to drive the LED. And I think I will be able to run that out the back, hook it up to something like a Raspberry Pi, and I will be able to do data collection. Then onto the RS-232, I wired a matching connector here, and we can plug that into the connector that comes off the display panel, and we'll just run it out uh, five or six spare pins on the RS-232 connector. DB25 has lots of spare pins. RS-232 only uses like three of them anyway. So here you can see where the wire comes off of the DB25. This is the new one that I added. Runs around, goes into connector, 
and then goes out to the display board. So then I wired up a cable to the DB25, so your standard DB25 to hook into the back of the GC1000, hooked up to those six unused pins that I hooked my um, instrumentation wires up to. And then we come into a little board here where all I've got here is a 10K pull-up. It's kind of a SIP resistor network for a 10K pull-up. Then I've got some 150 ohm protection resistors. That's just in case I misprogram the monitoring device, we don't accidentally put out a voltage on there and end up damaging something in the clock. Those 150 ohm resistors will current limit. And then I threw, just because I had them, I threw a couple ferrite beads onto the voltage going to the pull-up and onto the ground that links the monitoring device to the GC1000. And then for monitoring inside of here, you can't quite see it in here, but this is a Raspberry Pi 0W. Okay, let's take a look at the data that I collected. We have two browser windows open here. This one on the left is the MLA 30 Plus Mega Loop antenna. And this one on the right is my random length wire outdoor antenna hooked up to the 9 to 1 Unon. I discussed both of these antennas in the previous video, part one. So each one of these, I ran them for about 48 hours. The MLA 30 Plus antenna worked much better for me than the um, random length wire antenna did. And just to see how to read this graph, so this first graph up here is the high spec LED. So when it's lit up top, um, it means the high spec light is on. And then these little valleys down here at the bottom mean the high spec light is off. So with the MLA 30 plus, the high spec light was on 86.7% of the time over that 48 hour period. Now down here at frequency, we can see which frequency it's tuned to. At the very bottom is five. This one in the middle is 10 and then up here is 15. If you see this spiky up and down stuff, that means the radio is scanning through frequencies trying to find a good signal. So like right here, we were on 5, then we lost a uh, signal for a while, and we hunted, and we settled back down to 5, and a little bit of hunting. We were mostly at 5, and the periods of hunting, of scanning, correspond to these valleys down here where we lost high spec. Uh, so anyway, we were at 5 until about 6 a.m. and then it ended up getting 10 megahertz that's as expected and then about 9 a.m. it shifted up to 15 megahertz and it was at 15 megahertz for most of the day and then down here toward the evening um, about 5 p.m. we ended up at 10 and then for the night we dropped down to 5 and then you see a single stair step for the next day so that was the MLA 30 plus over here is the random length wire and you can see it's in high spec about half as much of the time. So that antenna is not working as good as the MLA 30 plus was. It's not amplified. It's running through kind of a long cable that goes outside um, to the other side of my garage. And you can see, um, so it's in high spec. Most of the time it's in high spec is during the day. It's like 6 a.m. on through to like 6 p.m. or so. And most of that time, it is in 15 megahertz, with a little bit down here in 10 megahertz. Um, not much 5 megahertz. It did actually get some 5 megahertz uh, sinking in right here. If we zoom in on that, you can see, yeah, right here we had, during the middle of the night, this was, uh, what, 3 a.m. to um, about 4 a.m. We captured 5 megahertz, and then we got it again at 4 a.m., to uh, 5 a.m., but that's that's kind of um, consistent with what I've observed, that my random length wire antenna it doesn't do so good at the 5 megahertz, but it, it does pretty darn good um, here at the 15 megahertz, and it does kind of so-so at, at the 10 as well. Okay, now it's time to talk about clock number two. So how did I end up with two of these? Well, if you remember right at the end of the last video on clock number one, I couldn't get it working, it wasn't syncing properly, I wasn't sure what it was supposed to sound like or whether the data light was supposed to flicker like it was. So I thought I will go on eBay and I will buy a clock that is good, one that the um, seller says works. Oh, eBay, why did I trust you so? Um, anyway, the next half of this video is going to talk about the repairs that I had to do to clock number two. Um, now, as received, uh, it wouldn't really tune 15 megahertz at all. It just, there was kind of a very light hiss. 
Um, on 10 megahertz there was some static noise but really no tones. 5 megahertz kinda came in but the uh, the capture and data lights never lit up on 5 megahertz. So what I ended up doing is I ended up completely tearing this clock apart. I ended up recapping it um, entirely just like I did with clock number one and then I went on to align uh, the RF receiver board and that's what really this video is going to focus on is aligning the RF receiver because it turned out even after I recapped everything it still wasn't bringing in 10 megahertz or 15 megahertz. So let's go ahead and disassemble clock number two. Okay, I glopped on a bunch of JB weld onto the broken mount there, and just for good measure I put some onto the good mount over here, and we'll just let this sit overnight, and that should be sorted out. Next up, I think we should take our main board and go on a recapping adventure, in particular this filter cap and these two filter caps down here. And one thing I usually like to do is to actually test the old capacitors to find out if they were bad. It's always good to know. 77 picofarads and a V loss of 61%. Yeah, I would say that <laughs> capacitor is no good. So interestingly, the RF board already has four Nichicon capacitors on it. Somebody's already recapped this. I don't think they replaced these 4.7 microfarads. I don't know that I have any of those on hand though. Tone board certainly has some old capacitors. Doesn't look like anyone's replaced these, so let me get to them. In the other clock, I used a film capacitor in this spot, and it seemed to work good, so we're going to use a film capacitor again. Why not? Getting data LEDs blinking. Still getting a very weak signal on it though. Doesn't pick up the 1000 Hz tone at all. Okay, let's go ahead and align this uh, Heathkit radio. So I have a couple pieces of equipment. I've got my oscilloscope and I have my um, signal generator, RF signal generator. This is a Siglent. Um, it is set to output 455 kilohertz. I believe that is the intermediate frequency of the radio. Um, it's set to do it at 100 millivolts peak to peak. And it's set to modulate a one kilohertz tone. And it is hooked up. One side of it goes to ground. The other side is going through a 0 .047 microfarad capacitor. And it's hooked up to one side of R339, which is the resistor that feeds the mixer capacitor. Um, and then I also have my oscilloscope hooked up. It's hooked up to the audio potentiometer, so that's going to get the audio out from the detector as well as ground. So we can see right now we're just getting noise on the scope. Now let's turn on the output. Now we've got a hundred, or uh, we've got a one kilohertz tone. 
Um, we can try to bring this down. It's good to bring it down kind of low um, because you don't want the AGC to kick in. I, I think 100 was about right uh, for tuning this up. And then what we're going to do, so we can both hear the signal as well as see the signal, we're going to adjust these um, cans in the IF section. So there's three of them. Here, here, and here. We're going to go from the one closest to the detector to the one closest to the mixer. Now as you adjust it, it will uh, peak in one spot and it'll dim in the others. So there, we can see it dimming on the scope and the sound went down. And there it's dimming on the other side, so... Just want to hit it to the peak. Then we want to do the next one, the middle one. And then we want to go over to this one here. Now this one here is actually all the way maxed out on its stop. And that suggests to me maybe there's a little bit of a problem because you'd expect it to not be maxed out. Maybe some other component has gone out of spec on it, like uh, the capacitor next to it, or there's a resistor here. Um, a little bit troublesome that we can't peak that any better, but we went, uh, you know, from detector toward mixer, and then, you know, we could go back, and you could do it again. And that gives me some level of confidence that we have the IF stage tuned properly. Now it's time to tune the RF. So I should mention that right now I have this radio set to the 5 MHz channel. It's locked to it. Um, I know I did that because I do not expect there to be any 5 MHz broadcast right now during the day. So what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect it. Well, we'll turn it off first. We will disconnect it from there. We will get rid of our capacitor, and I'm just going to take the, the hot output from the signal generator. I'll just clip it onto the black lead here, and this will be kind of like a little antenna, which we can tune. So we have the radio tuned to 5 megahertz. I'm going to go over here. I will take the signal generator, and I will tune it to 5 frequency, 5 megahertz. Now this is the 5 megahertz WWV broadcast frequency. So if we turn this on, now we're getting now we're getting RF. So this is acting like a little broadcast antenna. It's being picked up by the radio. Now ideally I'd use a plastic screwdriver for this, um, but my plastic screwdriver kind of won't turn these. Now we're going to tune these capacitors. So there's one here by the mixing stage and there's one over here by the antenna stage. And again, we're just looking for it to peak. And because I don't have a plastic screwdriver, I've got to kind of test it and move the screwdriver back away. That seems good, and then this one here. Okay, so we're getting our five megahertz. Uh, let's turn the volume down a little. Now we want to move up and we'll do the 10. So I'm going to go down here to the bottom. I'm going to flip the uh, the lockout 
from 5 megahertz to 10 megahertz. Hook my scope probe back up. Then we'll take this and we'll change it to 10 megahertz. So now uh, we're picking up the 10 megahertz signal and we'll do the same thing the 10 megahertz turn the volume Seems good. And now let's go do 15 megahertz. Okay, the 15 megahertz is selected. We need to come over here. 15 megahertz. Okay, and we're getting 15 megahertz. 15 megahertz seems to be the weakest of them all. Um, but let's see, I think we're ready to shut down. So there, we are getting a WWV signal. The lights on the front of the clock are blinking that it is receiving signal. It's still very, very staticky, so um, I'm kind of surprised that it's not um, coming through clearer right now. Okay, I'm going to plug it in and we'll see if we can get it to sync. Let's turn the sound on. All right, let us sit here and see what it does. The clock is synced! There, and that's a summary of clock number two. So, um, clock number two, after letting it run for most of the day and letting it tune all three bands, I can say that it does not tune as well as, as clock number one did. And I don't know why, because, you know, I did go through it and I did try to tune it up. Um, if people see anything about my tuning methodology that's wrong, let me know. I will try something else with it. It's possible that some of the component tolerances in the RF board have just, you know, they've, they've shifted and it's just not able to come fully back into alignment. 
Um, maybe I need to replace uh, you know, some of the resistors or capacitors. I don't know. It's getting a little bit more than I know what to do. I'd love to get this one working as well as the original because it is, cosmetically, it's a nicer clock. Um, but um, the other one still tunes better. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.